just to introduce myself, uh, already it's been done, but um, to give context what I work on, obviously computer vision. Uh, more specifically, I am interested in video representation learning and anything around humans in videos and dynamic scenes. So an example is text to video retrieval. Um, a lot of tasks where there's both vision and language involved. So an example is sign languages, sign language video recordings. Um, another one is uh, human motion. In this case, uh, given some text like sidekick, you want to generate um, a short 3D sequence of it. And also very briefly to advertise uh, my lab and Imagine in Paris, if you ever want to come visit to Paris, just let us know, you, we can arrange a talk and um, you can visit the lab. This is a picture from a lab retreat after the, the, the COVID. Uh, everybody was really happy on the beach. Okay, so let's, let's dive into this lecture. I'd like to first define where we stand. So here is um, kind of a diagram that uh, encapsulates everything under this AI umbrella, so artificial intelligence, which I also don't like as a term. But anyways, uh, we are here in the computer vision on the left circle and machine learning on the right circle. Um, so not everything in computer vision is done with machine learning. So there has been classical methods um, on, on the left side and deep learning is under the machine learning umbrella. And this lecture will be more focused on this intersection, this, this tiny intersection, uh, which is today more, more popular, deep learning for computer vision. And you can have other things like natural language processing, um, audio processing and other fields as well, you can imagine. So just to briefly define AI, we can say that it's any technique that enables computers to mimic humans. Ability to learn without explicitly being programmed, we can say this is machine learning. And for deep learning, it's machine learning with neural networks. Computer vision is extracting a visual, uh, from visual signals some meaning. And NLP can be extracting uh, meaning from textual signals and so on. Let's see. Okay. So today I'd like to basically do 101 for both computer vision and, and deep learning with uh, some general concepts and applications and examples, um, not, nothing too technical. Um, yeah, basically we want to summarize what standard layers uh, cons consist of a deep neural network, how we train them, uh, given a trained model, how we can interpret what's going on and visualize, and some tasks beyond classification and some progress we've made since um, 2012 revolution, let's say. And so I'll conclude with some final thoughts, which are very sub subjective. All right, so for what is computer vision? So we're making a lot of uh, pictures and videos, a lot of visual data these days with all the cameras we have in our pockets. So we want to automatically analyze these visual content. For example, uh, you're given an image and you want to extract meaning from visual signals. What is a meaning? Um, for example, in this case, we want to recognize the object in it, we want to detect, uh, localize the object in it. We can, you might want to segment every pixel. We might want to do 3D localization. So these are the meaning we, we, we refer to. And what is a visual signal? It doesn't have to be image. It can be a video, a series of images, frames. It could be depth, how far I am from a camera. It could be 3D point cloud and Im medical imaging like MRI and scans. So yeah, given an image, what are some example tasks? I really like these examples from Naila. Actually, she, she gave um, these examples last year, I believe. Uh, so you might want to recognize uh, objects. So naming uh, from a predefined set of categories, the objects in the image. You might also want to localize, which means putting a bounding box around them. We also call it detection. You might want to answer questions. Uh, given an image, so is this an outdoor scene? This is given and then the answer is yes. And just, just to let you know, when this visual question answering has started, I was quite skeptical whether this would ever work. And I'm really happy to see after seven years, it's getting uh, to work better. Um, activity recognition can be just like object recognition, but this time your set of classes are actions. So in this case, walking. 
Pose estimation can mean anything, actually. Um, it can be 3D, object, uh, 3D pose estimation, 2D pose estimation in terms of how I am rotated with respect to the camera and uh, look also translated. But in this case, it can also mean given a skeleton uh, to localize the joints in the skeleton um, in either 2D or 3D. Captioning is also something that starts to work recently. Um, so, given an image, I'll put in some natural language text that describes the content. So, this is going beyond a predefined set of categories already, so it's great. It's, but it's still using um, the, the limitations of language to express what's inside. Semantic segmentation, we love segmentation in computer vision, so for every pixel, uh, categorizing them into some classes, so sky, road, and also vegetation, not, not only the the foreground objects, but everything else in the background. Depth estimation. Uh, so as I said, depth is uh, for every pixel to estimate how far uh, the pic that pixel is from the camera. So it's a pseudo 3D, it's a, we call it 2.5D. So you don't have things behind that are occluded, but just the surface. And 3D shape estimation can be putting a mesh, a full surface around an object. So you, you might either have a template um, 3D mesh already, or you might also deform everything around the object. And finally, visual localization. So uh, putting also a trajectory or uh, localizing yourself in a 3D world. So any questions so far? So feel free to interrupt me if, if, you have, if something was not clear. All right. So. So this was some examples, just, of course, I didn't tell how these were um, obtained, but also the, these tasks were in a way a bit synthetic. So we, we create them in computer vision as tasks, but they are not directly applicable. Uh, they're not directly transferable to, to a product. So what can we do with applications in the real world? So some of them are already deployed in the real world. We all have our cameras, which puts the bounding box around the faces, so face detection works really well. Um, Self-driving cars, you might have encountered a lot of um, momentum in this area, um, but it's, it's not limited to computer vision. You can put a lot of sensors, not just cameras, in a car and uh, try to either automatically or semi-automatically um, drive a personless uh, car. Amazon Go, this is also uh, out there already. So um, shopping changes the, the shopping experience. Google Street View, so this car going around in the whole world and making both uh, the Street View and also um, other data available for the entire world. And robotics is uh, somewhat a bit behind, but we're trying to integrate perception in, in the way the robots uh, behave and act. So it, it's unlike in a factory where everything is well-defined. We want to communicate with the robot and maybe uh, teach them and tell them how to perform certain tasks. This is a video from my previous lab in Paris uh, taken by Igor. It's not a real uh, learning-based method. It was uh, programmed to serve wine to celebrate the when we bought the the robot to the lab, and you can also have medical applications. So this is also very uh, one of the useful applications um, based on medical images. In this case, uh, MRIs to detect vertebra, uh, but it could be to detect cancer and applications in biology. In accessibility, you can imagine that. If computer vision, the camera can extract all the meaning automatically. Um, for example, blind people can, can benefit from this. Um, but also, personally, I'm also working on, on sign language uh, to, for example, to enhance deaf uh, hearing communication. You could make use of uh, sign language videos automatically extracting uh, meaning, although this doesn't work. All right, so maybe let's shift the focus to deep learning for a bit and then we'll combine the two. So I have the, the deep in quotation marks. 
So just a little bit of recap on the basics of supervised learning. I'm sure you all know this, but to remind the terminology, we have a data set, so a training data, where in this case uh, you have labels, so supervised. X, let's, let's go from the computer vision. Um, X can be the image pixels, and Y can be the label, so let's go with object classification. So out of, let's say, a thousand categories, you have uh, one of those thousands labeled. The goal is to learn a function, uh, the parameters of a function, um, f, that goes from a data point to a decision space. And we do that by minimizing a loss. So we define a loss function. Maybe I have this already, yeah. I have the, the loss function uh, given the model and a data point compares it to the label, to the prediction, and does this over the entire training data. Um, to find the best parameters of that defined f. So deep learning is basically when this model f is a neural network and it, deep learning doesn't have to be supervised but it's just uh, the basic uh, form which is easier to explain for, for the loss. So what is a deep neural network? It's basically whenever you're stacking more than one layer. So here the w's are the layers, so you have an input, an output, so these are x and y, and you could either have a linear classifier, wx plus b, for example, it would be just one layer. And whenever you're stacking more than one layer, which is wx plus b, and then another wx plus b on top, um, it would be two-layer neural network. Of course, you can have nonlinearity and other things in between, but I'll come back to that. So what is a layer? Uh, it's typically just a simple matrix multiplication, so nothing fancy. Uh, but it, the function can take many forms. You can also define custom functions. It's just that if you want to optimize um, with gradient descent variant uh, algorithms, it, the requirement is that it has to almost everywhere be differentiable. And some of the examples of standard layers are fully connected, which is also under the name linear. A convolutional layer, pooling layer, there are many different forms of pooling. Nonlinearity, also there are different forms. And attention, I will not talk about it uh, myself because I think Luca will talk about it after me. Um, but how did this all happen? So we started way back in 1957 with Perceptron, which is the most basic form of a neural network that takes in um, basically X, so wx plus b, but there's a nonlinearity on top, which in this case is a sigmoid function. And at the time when this came out, uh, so this is a um, slide from Lana, in New York Times, there was all this exaggeration in the media. I'll just quote, um, the embryo of an electronic computer today that it expects will be able to walk, talk, see, write, reproduce itself, and be conscious of its existence. Of course, we are in 2022 and all this happened. Um, yeah, so thinking machines that will be able to read and write. Um, Perceptron will be the first non-living mechanism capable of receiving, recognizing, and identifying its surroundings without any human training or control. Maybe this is partly true. But yeah, media exaggerates as always. So let's just come back to today. Um, so, what do we mean by neural networks for computer vision? So basically, the advantage of deep learning is when you, ha you don't have to inject uh, domain knowledge, so you can just give in the raw data. In computer vision, we are giving in the raw pixels. So what is an image? It's a tile of values, and it's discretized, it's, which is nice for the computer, um, where every pixel, which is a, a square in this image, can take a value between 0 and 255. You have three channels, red, green, and blue, RGB. Um, so then it makes three times the width and height, the resolution of the image that goes in, um, to the, as input to the network. So I want to first give a context about the evolution of uh, the field, how things were done before deep learning era. So we would still give an Im images as input. Of course, we have to give at some point the raw image signal to the computer. But we were 
separating the, the pipeline into two parts where you would that's where the domain knowledge comes in. You would uh, hand design some features. So maybe let me detect the edges and then count how many of them are towards the right, how many of them towards the left, make a histogram, make some statistics over the training data, and make a really nice feature vector compressed in a low dimensional space. Then on top of that, I can use whatever machine learning community came up with and plug in my favorite support vector machine or random forest classifier, which is uh, relatively shallow. Uh, maybe a linear uh, classifier and get my object class. So the, the field were more interested on the left side. And here the um, trainable classifier is quite generic. What changed with deep learning is to combine this into a, a single model that makes the feature learning automatic. So what, that's the term end to end going directly from pixels to the, the output space. So then there is the feature hierarchy. The assumption is that the model, the black box, learns already some features, but we are not uh, manually designing them uh, for the computer. And each layer extracts features from the output of the previous layer. So it's, it's, this is the hierarchy and the, all the layers are tra trained jointly. Okay, so what's inside this black box? As we said, there are layers. So let's just go through some of the standard layers that make a neural network. So I'm showing here a typical 2012, uh, maybe you know, AlexNet model. Uh, the way it was structured was, uh, it, was co it consisted of eight bo blocks. There's already, just be aware, there's not the consensus on what a layer means. It can be a, a, every single function inside the model, or it can be a block, a series of functions. So in this case, I'm going to call all these uh, squares a block, so convolutional block. And inside, so con5, for example, you have three layers, the convolutional layer, nonlinearity, and pooling successively. And in a fully connected block, you have a fully connected layer and a nonlinearity. You could also have normalization layer. Um, so this is not I identical to the original AlexNet model, but this is how it looked like. Um, so whatever is in red is a, has learnable parameters. So what do I mean by that? Uh, when you minimize the function, um, they are parameterized um, by some weight. So if it's a linear layer, it's Wx plus b, the w and the b. They are the learnable weights, which might be randomly initialized. And over the training, you want to find uh, the optimal parameters that define them. But for pooling and nonlinearity, there might, but there might not have, uh, depending on what, how you define them, uh, any parameters. So let's go through uh, these layers one by one. So what is a fully connected layer? By its name, every neuron is connected to ev every input neuron is connected to every output neuron. So this is our um, linear layer, Wx plus b. I keep saying Wx plus b, but uh, this is a convention. So the w for the weight and b for the bias. Um, and to contrast it with the convolutional layer, um, you're basically removing some of the some of the connections. And the idea is that there, the locally, the pixels, pixels or any any data type that's similar to images, they have, uh, they're locally similar. So this convolution operation, which is going to be on the right, an example in 1D, slides through the input um, by filtering, by convolving, basically, if you're, if you're familiar with as the single processing term, with a filter. Um, that radically reduces the, the number of parameters, so that's an advantage. And if you want to see it in 2D, so we'll, we'll define the input this time, so before it was in blue, uh, a 1D input, so this time we have a 2D, two-dimensional input, which is a grid, and before the filter but, or the kernel was three-dimensional, H1, 2, 3, now it's two-dimensional, the kernel, so three by three. So the convolution operation basically does um, a dot product, let's call it. When you overlay, so the k goes on top, so the 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, these numbers on the bottom right corner are the kernel. And when you do the dot product, it's 1 times 0, 0 times 0, 0 times 1, 
you do all these multiplications and sum, sum these nine numbers into a single value, which adds up to one. Are you with me? Okay, so you, you, you slide the, the filter one by one to the right and to the bottom. So can anybody tell me what's this value gonna be? You can show with your hands. That's a, That means it's at most five, it's with a single hand. Okay, it's a four, so zero times zero, so a lot of zeros at the first row anyways. So one times two makes a two, and at the bottom you have one times one and one times one, another two, so you add two plus two is four. Okay, so that was convolution. Um, for max pooling, so any kind of there could be a, a different types of pooling operations. And the idea is to, well, in this case, is to go from an image to go, could, to go down to an object category. You need to reduce the dimensionality at some point. So you start with 200 times 200 resolution, and the output is, let's say, 1,000 categories, so 1,000 dimensional vector. So to reduce the dimensionality, one of the techniques is this pooling. It could be different types of pooling. Max pooling is basically also to convolve, well, sorry, also to slide window of a, of a kernel, in this case of size two by two. And for the red region, take the maximum out of these four values, which is six, maximum out of the green, which is eight. So you um, technically reduce the dimensionality from four times four to two times two. Uh, but also, there's interpretation that this keeps the most um, well, um, salient information. Also by making a little bit robust to translation changes. So depending on where the, we don't want the object, um, if you wanna do object classification, we want the output to be the same no matter where the object is in the image, which is not entirely true sometimes. Okay, uh, so I, I talked about nonlinearity. So what is it and why do we need this? So it can take many forms. We've seen sigmoid function, there is tan h function, and the, now the more popular ReLU and its variance, which is, um, which is more linear. But yeah, it's not differentiable at a single point at zero, uh, which we all ignore as a community, uh, but it works, so we don't care. So why do we need nonlinearity? Uh, we nonlinearities allow us to approximate any complex uh, functions, and this universal approximation theorem says that with a two-layer multiple uh, multi-layer perceptron an MLP, uh, we can non we can approximate any continuous function given enough hidden neurons. So what is enough hidden neurons? We don't know. So this is a two-layer and a very wide neural network we're talking about. But today we're more going towards uh, multiple layers, many more layers, but not that wide. So shallow, relatively shallow, uh, sorry, relatively narrow, but very deep. Um, and of course, if you only have linear layers stacked together, you cannot go beyond expressing a linear function. Uh, so we need to, we need to add Otherwise, it could be a single linear layer. Okay, any questions? Okay, let's move on to how we train, so how to optimize to find the best values of these parameters. I'll go really brief on this part, um, assuming that you have already some familiarity with these. So you have heard of stochastic gradient descent, good old SGD. I would like to first show some versions, well, the non-stochastic version, and stochastic gradient descent, the, the standard version, and the one we are actually using, which is SGD with mini batch most of the time. So the different, so let's just uh, define what is it. So it's starting from, as we said, a random initialization. So you have initialized all your weights to be some values. You want to change them in every iteration. So an iteration is where you sample some training data points. You want to change the, the parameters in a way that goes 
um, closer to the optimal uh, state. And how do we change them? By just subtracting um, the gradient. So the gradient is given the current state and some parameters uh, and the loss function. Which direction should my parameters take to get to, towards the optimal um, state? So this is theta t is the current iteration t, the parameters value, and the delta l, the, uh, the gradient with respect to theta, the gradient of the loss with respect to theta, uh, is the is the gradient basically, and the alpha is the learning rate or the step size with which you are making steps. So how much you're changing the gradient and uh, the parameters in each uh, iteration. So you st subtract that value and it becomes your theta t plus one next uh, iteration's value. So if you have um, your iteration is defined by the entire training data, so you have to sum the loss over the entire training data to be able to compute one single gradient step, this is called the gradient descent. Of course, today with the, the giant training sets that we have, uh, it's not even possible to to fit them all in memory or compute to make only a single step. So that's why we're doing stochastic version of it, which is at every step we're sampling a single eye, a single data point, computing the loss uh, with respect to that and making a step towards that, maybe a tinier step because that may be very noisy, it might not be reliable, we don't want to put all our eggs in the same basket. And but this is this can be well as we said ran, the the noise can be huge to, to make you move in the wrong direction, but also a bit inefficient uh, because when you batch things together, um, it it tends to to compute faster at least on the GPUs today. So that's why we're using uh, stochastic gradient descent with mini batches, which is um, the loss over k samples instead of 1 or n, so it's a value between 1 and n, which is a very application dependent, data type dependent, could be, could be 10, could be 100, or it could be 1000, um, and making a step uh, with respect to that. Okay, so how do we compute the gradients? So in theory, we just have the gradients of composite functions, so it's a layer by layer structure, so we can apply chain rule. Uh, but there's an efficient way to do it called backpropagation. So with a forward function, if you have these layers of eight layers of each with its own W, so they have their own uh, gradient with respect to the loss, that's what we are going to compute. But just to recap the, the chain rule and the scalar version, you have the forward function going from uh, X0 to Xn with a series of functions F1 to Fn. The derivative would be f1 with respect to x0, f2 with respect to x1, etc., etc., to get the dx and uh, dx0. But in practice, this is not what we are doing. Um, so, in in the case of derivatives, if we have seen the scalar case, scalar in, scalar out, um, in gradient we call uh, the gradient when it's a vector in and scalar out. Jacobian is when it's a vector in, vector out, and generalized Jacobian, which is the, the category we fall in most of the time, uh, is tensor in, tensor out, if you want to uh, take the gradient of a given layer with respect to the previous layer. But in practice, it's impractical to store this in memory, so if you have a fully connected layer that takes in uh, n times m, so n data samples, or k data samples from the previous examples, and which are each m-dimensional, and the output is, for each of them, it's d-dimensional. If you want to compute the, the Jacobian for that, it's going to be n times m, n times d, which could be, for this example, 68 billion numbers. It's 256 gigabytes in memory um, for a very small batch size of 64 and a reasonable dimensionality 4000 for input and output. So for the chain rule, the idea is to start from the loss, which is a, always a scalar, and then uh, you don't need the explicit forming of the entire Jacobian. You just do the last layer with respect to the loss, 
you take that, you go to the previous layer again with respect to the loss. So then it becomes the gradients become the same dimensionality as the parameters themselves. So I really recommend if this is unclear because I find it a bit difficult to explain sometimes to go through this very short PDF. I guess the slides will be distributed in your own time. So when you train, okay, so we start with a random initialization, we take our uh, steps a bit mini batches. What can go wrong? Many th things can go wrong. The, in the first trial, nothing works really. So then we go through this uh, golden rules to debug uh, what we can uh, make better. Many times, uh, especially if we are not working with the standard data sets of ImageNet or uh, things where we know things work. If you're working on your own data set where you're just building a new training set, you want to try something. And if you don't have enough data, overfitting occurs really easily because you take a model that's been designed for a large data set and then of course it doesn't work for your small small data. So what what can you do? You can just reduce the model size. So this is not tricky. Uh, this is not easy, sorry. It's a bit tricky to just uh, reduce the, the um, it's, it's a whole engineering to to find the best architectures. But that is one thing to do. Data augmentation always, well, not always, but most of the time uh, is the key to avoid overfitting. So just slightly changing your inputs could be Gaussian noise. It could be just if it's an image, changing the colors a little bit. Then you can also do early stopping. So there's, you just run this iterations, T, T plus one, et cetera, and which is constantly minimizing your training loss, but you wanna stop somewhere where it doesn't perfectly memorize the training set, but generalizes also to a validation set. Um, well, there are techniques like dropout and weight decay also, um, that are quite standard. Maybe I will now, what time do I have? One hour, 20 minutes, right? Okay, that should be fine. I'll go through some interpretation of what goes in a neural network black box. So let's just remember this AlexNet-like structure. So from Krzyzewski in 2012, when they came up with this eight layer going from 224 times 224, so the width and height of the image, times three for the RGB, dimensional input down to 1000. So this was um, what worked at the time. So I'm gonna visualize this convolutional blocks, what's going on in them. So you trained it with um, object classification loss, and then now you're trying to visualize what's going on inside the model. So for layer one, so the convolution one, here in the, in the first operation that corresponds to the first block, you have filters of size seven by seven um, times three, they're colored, and the first, uh, th so these are the filters on the right, and there are maybe 64 of them, I don't remember. Um, so if you visualize each of them, there's the, the striking uh, properties that they look like the good old Gabor filters that also look at some edges, blobs, and maybe they're uniform, they maybe they detect certain colors. And when you trace back, so let me just explain what I'm showing on the left. Uh, if you trace back what how, which images or which patches correspond uh, to certain filters. So here, maybe I forgot the, um, I'm sorry for lack of a citation. So this is 2014 ECCV best paper award actually. At the time, it was one of the first to visualize uh, what's going on. They visualize uh, on each uh, three by three corner, uh, top nine active, top nine patches that maximally activates for a given filter. So let's say I have this filter here, which is slightly diagonal, uh, changing colors. This nine patches, when you convolve with uh, this filter, give the highest output value. So it's just out of my validation set, I can uh, sort the patches 
the output of each patch and then just take the maximum nine and visualize which what they look like. So you can realize that whichever uh, the patches that maximize the most, they look like the filter themselves. So because it's a, that product is kind of a correlation operation um, that's maximized when the filter is similar to the to the input. So this is very easy to visualize for the first layer because you can also visualize the filters. But starting from the second layer, the filters become higher and higher dimensional. So it, this is three, three channels. And the next layer, it becomes 64 channel, 1000 channel and so on. So they're not uh, interpretable for human eye. But we can still do this maximum nine operation to see for each filter what corresponds to it. Is that clear? I'm having a hard time sometimes explaining. Okay. Um, so for the layer two, you have the same thing, but this time you're uh, observing structures that are slightly more complex. It could be like a little sphere uh, or even part of an object. But layer three is where it becomes more like object parts, even some, some faces appear. Um, Maybe here some eyes, some yellow eggs or or lemons. So in layer four, it's getting more interesting of almost an entire object, but sometimes still not in all of it. So keyboards, dog faces. Okay, so the idea is that um, by looking at this, so I'm not gonna show beyond layer four because it's, um, layer four and five are similar in that they are both looking at object parts and layer six, seven, eight, they're fully connected so they don't have a um, spatial resolution. So it's difficult to visualize the filters, but it's the same idea where a single neuron activates or is responsible more and more for a given object towards the end of the, this is the goal of the network by the end of the eight layer one neuron has to correspond to an object category, right? So the way the model deals with this is to build a feature hierarchy going from edges and blobs up to some textures, then to parts of objects and then the objects themselves. And the respective field, um, it also uh, gets larger and larger. So the, as I showed in the first layer, the patch uh, each filter sees a seven by seven image. So that's why on the left, you also see seven by seven patches and it gets larger and larger. So after layer five, it sees the entire image. Okay, so any questions on that or not? Okay, hopefully I'm not losing you. Just a brief history to say that CNNs were not invented overnight. We had all the, not all the tools, but um, the building blocks and, and the, the technology already back in 1998 for digit recognition from uh, grayscale, much uh, smaller resolution images, a few layers of convolution and fully connected down to 10 categories, so uh, the digits. And what happened in 2012? Um, so basically we had more data, more compute power, and a bigger model. So those things made things uh, work and change and attract the attention of all the field. And since 2012, there have been other um, follow-ups, the, the Google Net Inception, VGG, ResNet, uh, whatever uh, you want on the CNN side. And um, the performance, Sorry, the performance of those. So if you compare the um, top five error rates, so on the 1000 way classif classification um, performance. So pre deep learning, there was this challenge running on this data set and every year they were organizing in the conference, people submit their models and their results. They get uh, the performance. So the green ones on the left are pre deep learning, a classical computer vision with um, bag of words, Fisher vectors, or a SIFT, 
and all these techniques, so hand, in, hand engineering features. Suddenly, the, and then the performance difference between methods were really tiny. And 2012, suddenly the, the winner was much, uh, much better with a large margin than the classical methods, which uh, opened the eye of everyone. So this is AlexNet in 2012, and then every year the, the deep learning models got better. Also, we also got better in overfitting to this data set. Who knows, because they're also getting better than humans. But it's a it's a very strange data set in that a lot of the categories are dog breeds, so people can be also um, having a hard time. So yeah, just just to also repeat why why now? So this already existed before. It's a combination of things. Uh, that was the right moment where we had a large data set, ImageNet, collected by um, people in Stanford. Uh, with Amazon Mechanical Turk, a lot of uh, crowdsourcing to, to label these images, so fully supervised hardware. So GPUs um, are special to, well, especially um, appealing for matrix multiplication. They are really good at doing very cheap processes in parallel. So this is what a neural network does, especially if, uh, on a single layer. Um, it can be done really fast. The more deep you are, the more sequential operations you have to do. Uh, this is why batching multiple inputs is also advantages. Uh, and also we had, well, not at the 2012 time, because um, poor Krzyzewski had to, had to implement his own um, code, but today with PyTorch, TensorFlow, and whatever uh, tool I can't uh, keep up. I, I started my PhD with the Lua Torch and Matkovnet and Cafe, um, which were relatively uh, well easier than and, uh, going to the CUDA code. But yeah, this made things, thank you, um, much easier to make progress. OK. So I talked a lot about convolutions and showed a very standard old model. So um, there, just be aware, and I think the next talk we'll, we'll talk about this more. Um, there have been quite recent um, questioning going on. Do we need, even need convolutions? If you have enough data, can we go uh, to more complex models? So as I said, the advantage of convolutions is to reduce the parameters. So. There has been this hype to go from um, convolutions, questioning attention, questioning attention, and going back to the basics of MLP, multi-layer perceptron, and then also not convolutions, not attention, not MLP in patches. Anyways, so it's hard to hard to follow up, but there has been a period where uh, MLPs were um, shown to outperform both attention and convolutions. Okay. So, in the last uh, part, I'd like to show a few examples without going again to technical details. What we like, what progress we made since the the classification of ImageNet. Yes, sure. Yes. Yes, well, that's the uh, human annotator performance. But yeah, I'm not, in, uh, I'm not familiar with the exact details of how, but it might be a subset, I imagine. It's not, it's not the same annotators that perform this study, I think. But so a human is annotating wrong, like it sees a cut and it annotates is like something else. I think the study is not exactly the annotator performance, but there are humans, uh, I think, annotate, not annotating, but uh, labeling a subset to come up with this value. But what you can imagine is that there are many humans where that the deep, the model, deep model interpolates from, so it, it combines all the information of multiple annotators, and I'm not sure how, maybe I have to check how many humans, especially for this study, was used, whether it was the entire test set or a uh, subset. I don't remember. Yeah, that, that's interesting because in 2016, 
so then how they train the model that then performs better than the kind of the training set yeah I'll yeah so I, my answer is it's not really the training set but also at this point where this is the zone we're starting to overfit to a certain data set because every, everybody's trying so many different models and we have seen the test set so many times which is uh, not a good machine learning practice so yeah thank you thanks All right. Okay, so I was saying that uh, we, the field has moved beyond dogs and cats uh, since a couple of years at least. So I'd like to show a few examples of some works uh, that have been uh, quite influential. So object recognition, so classification, has been given an image to reduce it to down to a category, but uh, in many applications, you might also need to localize uh, on the image where they are. And this was YOLO in an oral presentation in 2016, where the presenter was brave enough to do a live demo in front of thousands of people. where the advantage of uh, the model was to run real time and put multiple bounding boxes, not just a single label for an image. He's wearing a tie and of course there is a tie category in the data set. It says tie. And he brings some dogs and cats, even though tiny ones, and a bicycle. So yeah, there were around, so it looks impressive, but there were around 80 categories as opposed to the thousand uh, in the original um, classification data set. So here it's for 80 categories it can put bounding box. And then we made some more progress in just not just a box, but also putting um, the boundary of, of the objects, so segmentation with MASCAR CNN and others. Here is for human pose estimation, where you're mapping, so it, it's almost 3D, you're mapping every single person to a template 3D model. And given person detection, so putting a box around each person, you can obtain multi-person outputs as well. So this got better since then, but the key then was to collect and uh, pay annotators to make it work. So more recently, you might have heard of CLIP. What is this CLIP? It's a contrastive language image pre-training that has been uh, trained not with classification labels, but with language labels. So it potentially goes beyond a predefined set of categories and to the entire language. And the key to the success of this was to use 400 million image text pairs from internet. And for each, so this is this time the label is a text for each image. The, the idea is to build a representation uh, that matches, um, that finds a cross-model space between image and text where the embedding of the image and the embedding of the text, if they correspond to each other, lies uh, close to each other in this space. So that's the contrastive objective. So if I have an image that describes uh, Pepper the Aussie Pop, so the dog, I want to make these two the most similar and anything else in, in the batch or so in the K images, there are other texts that corresponds to them. Maybe they describe a cat or something else. We, I want to push them away. So I want to make contrast and push other texts away and pull my corresponding text closer to my image embedding. So we have 
kind of uh, extended this work. So this is probably the only uh, research for my work I'm going to show to video retrieval. So not just text and image, but text and video to map them in the same space. So the idea is that you have some text and you have a gallery of videos. You want them, so you have a distance to each of them with this method and you can find the closest one uh, from your gallery, which got, you have a similarity score between each of your text embedding, each, the query text embedding, and each of your uh, videos, um, video embeddings, and you query the, the most similar. I will show a demo, uh, which is online. If you want to uh, find it, it's called Frozen in Time. You can type some text, so family, and retrieve the closest videos in the gallery, family camping, family camping in the snow, family camping in the snow at night. So it goes more and more detailed and can be compositional. Man and dog, man and dog on the beach. Oil rig, oil rig from above. So also uh, encoding the viewpoint, for example. Skier, skier riding a chairlift. So as you can see, it's, well, this is for videos, but the same thing happens for images as well. So we go beyond a single object label for uh, a symbolic label for um, a visual content, but we can describe multiple things. Maybe we have never seen the word um, chairlift before, but we have seen uh, telesiege or um, it, it can also make use of the, the ambiguities in the language, um, do zero shot, so it has uh, generalized the things it has never seen before. Okay, uh, well, more recently there's this another hype uh, towards given a text to generate the image. So again, mapping the, um, the bridge between text and image. Um, and this has been also, like the key to success of this has been also, of course, some models, but the models existed before um, the, the collection of large data sets. So I'd say we made a lot of progress on vision and language, uh, which I wouldn't believe um, seven, eight years ago. But we still lack um, some progress to be made on 3D, uh, long-term video understanding, and also making robots um, perceive the world without being explicitly programmed. And I, as I said, there are multiple ingredients to what makes deep learning. Uh, so there's the model definition, so there's whole architecture how, what should be my kernel size, what should be my number of layers. So defining this connectivity and learnable parameters. Uh, there's also the loss, how to, given some data, so maybe it's labeled, it's not, how to define the loss function, where to find the data, and the optimization algorithm. So I would say in this order, the computer vision community was really interested in finding the architecture at the beginning after 2012, all this ResNet, Inception, um, VGGNet, etc. And then there has been a period where all the, the titles or all the papers, the papers that got the most number of uh, lost terms in their objective function got accepted. So I remember a paper with 11 lost terms in it. But I say today, these days, uh, the winners are more the ones that collect the biggest data and we're focusing seeing a lot of focus on that but of course everything else is uh, keeps happening but I would say this is the order of things and we always leave the optimization algorithm to machine learning people we take whatever uh, whatever is um, designed there and so uh, Adam Adam W and um, just plug them in okay so Maybe in the last five minutes, ten minutes, I would uh, reflect on some thoughts on the field. This is quite subjective. So, of course, more data is great, but it comes with its own challenges and struggles. So it, you have to store them somewhere, you have to process them somewhere, uh, you have to train on them somewhere, and uh, you need servers and 
um, it, it comes with its own costs, not just the server itself, the electricity. Um, so that's, um, that's an entire discussion on should the research be um, more advantages for those that have the computational power. Then more and more we see recently is the licensing and uh, privacy issues for, for data sets. So because you're going beyond a set of uh, closed set of uh, images that you have full power and you can even look at them all to now the entire web. And there are certain biases in the web. There are certain um, copyrights, for example, if you want to uh, have faces. Um, you have, should we ask permission for, from everyone in the, that appear in the data set? We're also working with movies for video research. And of course, people, there's a huge in industry behind making those movies. Um, can we just scrape them from the web and, and use them for machine learning? We don't know. Of course, we, well, the answer is we can't, but uh, so far we've been doing. So it's, this has been changing a bit recently, so we're more uh, conscious about that as a field. Another thing is annotation cost. Of, it's, it doesn't end when you have the data. Uh, it works best when you have at least some of the labels. And um, sometimes if it's videos just by watching without annotating, it, take, it can take your whole lifetime just to go through the, the data set. So you need to paralyze over multiple people and some of the tasks require experts. So we're annotating sign language videos since two, three years and we cannot go parallelize over multiple people because we don't have that many expert annotators that know sign language. Um, and you also have in this research the difficulty of evaluation sometimes, so we are very good at optimizing certain metrics, but certain tasks like generative models, as I showed, the text to, to, text to image, how do you assess the performance? There's, uh, there's more than one true image that corresponds to, to some text. We cannot just do L2 distance between two pixels. Um, and this is, and if you do human evaluation, so asking uh, users, uh, you, you cannot repeat the same study. If you go from one paper to another, it's not reproducible. Okay, uh, and of course there's the bias in the test sets. Uh, you can have your little world where everything per works perfectly. You train on, on the train set, test on the test set, they come from the same distribution and you apply it on, on in the wild and it, everything fails. That's what I meant by uh, the YOLO object detection author being brave about doing a live demo because things can go wrong when you deploy. And as, a, as some thoughts on, on the view of, on, of the field, um, it's great that things start working. So that means it's bringing money because it has applications in industry. That means it attracts more people so the community gets bigger. That means there's more competition. You have to uh, compete with the others in the community and it might end up unhealthy, both for research and for uh, people's health in general. And there's the saying from David Forsyth saying, notice of the community is very naughty because you have that many uh, so many people that even the, the minimum uh, can be really low and you might have to bring some new rules and um, uh, to just avoid things going bad. And the field has moved so quickly, so in 2021 can be really old, outdated papers. So this, is, this has not been the case before. And uh, yeah, I'd like, I just wanted to show also from the last part that the field has moved largely beyond dogs and cats. Uh, there are of course still research going on uh, to beat this uh, ImageNet performance, but the recent trends has been open vocabulary recognition, uh, robotics, multimodal video data, also using audio, not just the, the visual content, and continual learning, so going beyond fixed training sets. Of course, we still have these low-level tasks, so semantic segmentation or object detection, which can be building blocks for a later, uh, for a more complex pipeline. Um, but yeah, this is what I mean by trends, is more like high-level. Um, and just a picture from Costa uh, from 2019 CVPR, which was the one before uh, the pandemic. So with about 10,000 people, of course, with, with the 2020 and 21 being online, this has, uh, didn't happen. And 22, I think we were 
down to 5,000, I'm not sure, but still um, before that there has been an exponential increase. So, okay, so it's very crowded, so if you want to peacefully research away from competition, what you can do? I don't know, and Google doesn't know either, so I just typed in how to avoid competition, it just tells me how to compete. Um, so I just tried to find a few, so this has been uh, some slides I've done for the lab. A uh, few ways to, to still enjoy the research and uh, deal with this competition. You just uh, the key is to focus on your research, of course, to enjoy it, be okay with failures, because 90% of the times things don't work. You have to be stubborn to try again and again. And do not be afraid of concurrent work, because at this uh, scale of number of people, it will eventually happen that someone else will, will do the same thing for, uh, as you. And do not check archive slash Twitter every day. So the day can be every hour, every minute, every week, for whatever frequency you're, you're used to, because it's an illusion of success stories. And just when you do, be happy for others and do not compare yourself, um, because there's no end to competition. So it's a really nice short, short story from Tolstoy uh, to just finding a balance and appreciating uh, your current position. Another solution which might or might not work all the time is to determine your research topic slightly away from the crowd. And sometimes this crowd can be some useless benchmarks anyway, so it's, it doesn't matter. And for, to find a problem where you have the, enough resources for. And also it's good to lead the research instead of following um, others sometimes. So by lead, I mean you can define, maybe the, the benchmark is useless, just collect your own benchmark. If you can write a criticism in your paper, and uh, if a metric is not useful, just uh, invent a new one. Uh, and also, if somebody else just published a paper on your very same problem, uh, the glass half full, uh, uh, luckily the research doesn't care who solves the problem as long as it's solved, so that's that's a really good news that somebody else did. And the other glass half full is that your problem is worth solving. So because sometimes you work on something, you th uh, you're not even sure if it's worth. So the end result is that you have a, a glass completely full. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for <laughs> bearing with me.